Tonight I want to speak a little bit on how, how do you receive what you ask for. Too many times we have prayers that are unanswered. Well, most of the time that the prayers that are unanswered, one is because we're not in God's will, and two, because they're self-seeking prayers. Too many times it's about me, it's about I, it's about what I can gain, what I can do. But imagine if our prayers were all revolved around the kingdom of God. Which that's actually what God has called us to live out our lives is that way. Is to be in a position before him that everything in our life revolves around the kingdom. That everything in our life is about him and not about us. But in America, I'm so blessed that we were born in America. But at the same time, it's a curse. It's a blessing for our flesh. But in the spirit... It's hurt us because America is all about me. God bless America. Remember the first time I saw a bumper sticker that said, America bless God. That that's the way it should be, but it's all about us. God, what can you do for us? God, how can you bless us? God, what about us, us, us? That in everything you look, it's about us. And I see other countries that they'd sacrifice their life for God. But in America, we want God to sacrifice his life for us. Imagine if we began to live like God has called us to live for the kingdom. In John 15, 7, if you guys have your Bibles, turn there with me. We're talking about abiding. Abiding in him and him in us, the word in us. Abide means to accept or act in accordance with. John 15, 7, it says, If you abide in me, and I want you to listen to this. It says, If you abide in me, as we've all heard, it says, And my words abide in you. It says, You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done unto you. Too many times, here's what we do. Is we take this scripture and we say, If you ask what you desire... It will be done for you. And we take it out of context. If you ask what you desire, you hear non-Christians quote that. If you ask what you will, it will be given unto you. If you ask what you desire, he'll give it to you. And then what happens is, is individuals ask for something and they do not receive. And they think God left them, forsake them, didn't come through, didn't answer them. But we forget the key part of this verse. It says, if you abide in me, and then it says, and my word abides in you. If it actually lives inside of you and you live daily by what my word says. If you actually follow out what my word says, you take it to heart and you become one with it. He says, then you ask what you need. And I'll give it to you. But what happens is, is we ask for things of the flesh that have nothing to do with things of the spirit. We ask for things that will benefit us, but not benefit God. But what he's saying here, he's not just saying, if I live in you, but he's saying, if my words are what lives in you and through you, and if my words are what guides you and directs you, your thoughts. That if it's my word that lives in you, and when it lives in you and it abides inside of you, it begins to change your thought process. It begins to change the way you think, the way you begin to desire things, and so much more. I've told you guys before, you've probably heard this, some of you, that I remember laying in my bed crying out to God. I lost everything. 
filing bankruptcy, lost my business, moved back home with mom and dad. And God said, if you'll turn to me, I'll give you the desires of your heart. If you'll turn to me, I'll give you the desires of your heart. And then once I turned to him, I realized that the desires of my heart were no longer my desires, but they were his desires. That the things that I wanted before I turned to God was the things that I went to God thinking, wow, if I turn to him, I can get this. And then once I turned to God and I begin to allow the word to abide in me, my heart's desires were his desires. What I began to want and I began to need and what I began to desire and what I began to pray for and cry out for was no longer about me, but it was about Him. And as this begins to live in you, through you, and out of you, your entire thought process begins to change. The things that you desire begin to change. It no longer begins to be about you, but it begins to be about those around you. It begins to become about God. It becomes something so much greater. Because when you begin to, it says, live by the Spirit and not by the flesh, you begin to realize that things of the flesh won't please you. You begin to realize that the things that your flesh once desired, that you could have an abundance of it and you'll never be satisfied. You'll never find joy in it. You'll never be happy in it. And once you begin to realize where true joy comes from, then you begin to realize what you should pray for. Then you begin to realize what the world is lacking. And too many times what's happening in the church is is we're trying to bring the world into the church instead of the church out into the world. That the church is turning into the world. It's truly turning into the world. So instead of the church abiding in this, it begins to abide in the world. It begins to think about money and money and money. I was talking to my grandfather on the phone earlier. He was talking about how his church is, the church they're at is growing and they're building and they're adding on and all this stuff. And I told him, I said, that is awesome, it's great, you know. Advance in the kingdom. I said, but continue to pray for your pastor. Because so many times what happens is they're focused on building and their mind begins to get on the physical things instead of the spiritual things. They begin to look at church as a business because you have to run it as a business in a certain aspect. Can't be stupid with your money. But it begins to your focus begins to be on something else instead of where it should be. I have a trainer. When she started, it wasn't about money. She didn't need money. She just wanted to help people. So she could care less about money. And then her husband left her, and now it's about money. I need to make money. I have to make money. But it's funny how things change over time. How things begin to change in our lives. But we have to remember to keep it, the word, where it needs to be. And when you begin to stop dwelling on this, stop abiding in it, it's when your thought process begins to change. I remember from going from a young man on fire from God to being out in the world furthest away from God I could be. And it all started with a slow process of this being eliminated from my life. I didn't just wake up one day and all of a sudden I was a heathen. Sometimes it feels that way. What happened? And you go, oh my gosh. I used to be so on fire for God. What happened? But it was about a process of not abiding in this any longer. It was a process of, over time, abiding in the world instead of abiding in the Word. And too many times that's what happens. And a lot of times it's not even something that we do. What happens is so many times is we get wrapped up in life so much that the thing that counts the most we put on the back burner. We get wrapped up in our jobs, in school. We get wrapped up. They say so many pastors get wrapped up in church that they don't pray or read anymore. They, they read the Bible for a sermon 
I, I've had, I talked to a pastor once. He said, you know, I got to the point that I was studying to get a good sermon, but I wasn't studying any longer to learn the word, to get closer to God. It was about a, a good presentation, a good sermon. I forgot how, I don't remember statistics, but it was something huge. Like, I don't remember, it was like 80 or 90% of pastors don't pray. It blew my mind. But what happens is, is they get caught up in the business of church. They get caught up trying to prepare a message. They get caught up in the counseling. They get caught up in the building of the church. They get caught up in the business part of the church, and they forget about the true business of who it's all about. And it wasn't something that they purposely meant to do. But it's something that happens over time when you stop allowing God to abide in you and you in Him. When you stop allowing the Word to abide and live in you. But you have to continue, continue to abide in it. It's not something that you you read once and you say, okay, I'm done with that book. It's something that actually becomes alive to you more and more every time you pick it up. I used to wonder what in the world people were talking about. That the word becomes alive. That it says, it says that his word is alive to the believer. And it's a mystery to the unbeliever. And it is, when you first pick this up, you're like, what in the world are they saying? And then as you begin to read it, and you begin to focus on God, and you begin to pray, and you begin to read, and you begin to pray, God begins to give you revelations, He begins to speak through you, and every time you pick this book up, you go, wow. There are times that I've heard the same scripture over and over and over and over again, and all of a sudden I'll read it and go, wow. Wow. There's been times I've heard messages, and all of a sudden I have to double question the revelation I got on the scripture because I'm like, I have never heard it preached that way before. Like you were talking about Job. Sometimes we take things in a certain context, we take it in a certain way, but we don't look at the whole thing. We don't look at it in a certain way. We don't allow God to speak to us. The greatest thing with this word is allowing God to speak to you as you read it. Well, how do you do that? You abide in it. You live in this. It's not something that, that should be not even your daily, just your daily bread. It is your daily bread, but you should allow it to come into you and live in you and then live out of you. It should be something so much greater, something so much more, something that you desire to become like, that we should desire to become like Christ, that these words need to be your inspiration. I love this. Right before that and right afterwards, he says, if you abide in me, and I in you. He says, then you'll bear fruit. He said, for without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Then he says again, if you are not in me and I am not in you, then you will be like a branch that dies and is thrown into fire. What you must to become is in harmony with him. You must become one with him. And when you do, you become in harmony with him. You begin to walk as Christ walked. Our goal on earth is to begin to walk like Christ walked. Isn't that the definition of a Christian? To be Christ-like? That our goal should be to walk like Christ walked. How did Christ walk? It says he walked. The first thing that he said when he preached was repent. That was his first sermon. He didn't stand up and give this feel-good message. He said, you need to repent and turn from your sins. Repent. 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 
And I'm telling you, that's the way I base my messages. Is how did Jesus preach? He never tried to say something to make people feel good. He tried to say things to deliver them. He tried to say things to help set them free. He tried to deliver a message that would change their life. Not so they'd walk away and go, oh, he's a good preacher. He could care less what people thought of him. It was about the Father. He could care less if they persecuted him. It was about the Father. That in everything he did, he walked around to be Christ-like. He walked around preaching which he's called us to do, each and every one of us, to go out and preach the gospel to all the world. To go out and to make disciples. What did Jesus do? He made disciples. And what did he call us to do? To go out and make disciples. And then what else did he do along the way? He cast out demons. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. And if we're supposed to be like him, therefore we should begin to do these things. Therefore, our faith needs to be raised up to a level that we're able to do these things. That we get to a place with Him. It says hearing is believing. And hearing and hearing and hearing of the Word of God. That, that we have to get to a place of knowing, and I'm going to continue this in a moment, that even with our prayers, that our prayers come to pass because of the faith that we have. Because when you begin to get in unity with God, you become where he wants you to be. You begin to know that you're in his will. And when you're in his will, you can ask for things and know that you'll receive. Because you're asking in his will. Too many times we're outside of his will. We ask for things and we don't have the faith to receive it. But when you become in his will and you know the plan that he has for you and you know what you're doing is what he's called you to do, you can begin to ask and know you'll receive. As the word says, you can begin to receive what he has for you in such a greater way. You know, I was thinking earlier, to be like someone... To walk like them, you have to act like them. You must practice to be like them. You must know them. You must be around them. You must hear them. To be like Christ, it's a lot more than hearing a story about them. It's a lot more than reading a book about them. If I want to act like somebody, if I want to act like Pastor Mike here, Amy, if you told me about him, and that's all I knew is what she told me about him, I probably could never act like him. But if I begin to hang around him, I begin to fellowship with him, I begin to get to know him, I begin to to build such a great relationship with him, I'll probably start acting somewhat like him. (laughs) But that's why we need to choose our friends wisely, too. Because too many times we, we hang out with the world, and I hear the excuse, well, I want to win them. Too many times they win you. Too many times they win you. And I'm not saying that, I mean, we are supposed to go as Jesus did. He went and ate with the sinners. Didn't say he went and got drunk with the sinners. That to become like him, you need to know him more. You need to begin to have a whole new revelation of him. Begin to feel his love. Because you can't show love unless you know love. Too many people, you you see people that have been hurt, and they can't show love because they've never been shown love. That when you begin to know God and you begin to allow him to pour his love out on you, you can begin to show love too. You can begin to show so much more because without him, we know what, we don't even know what love is. Then, once you begin to get in harmony with him, you begin to walk like him, you begin to speak like him, you begin to read your word, you begin to allow it to dwell in you. Then you begin to fulfill his plan for your life. 
but, but it's steps. It's a process. Too many times and people just want to jump in and do the ministry. But there's a process that it takes to get there. You have, let's, let me rephrase that. You can jump right into ministry. But too many times people want to jump into a full-time ministry where it's about them. It's about their face. It's about them winning people. It's about them doing this. But God's not looking for somebody that's looking for them to do something. He's looking for somebody that could care less if they're known for it or not. Somebody that will step up and do things in the background that nobody else knows about. Then God goes, that's who I can use. He's not looking for someone that wants to be the face. He's looking for someone that's hiding their face. He's looking for someone that says, this isn't about me. This is about God. This has nothing to do with me. I watch individuals. I, I've had people that I, I watch, and I won't put them in a leadership position because of the fact it's about them being in a leadership position. There was a time while Craig wasn't here. Somebody wanted to be the worship leader. I wouldn't allow them to be the worship leader because it was all about them being the worship leader. I had someone that wanted to head up small groups. But they didn't want to lead a small group. They just wanted to head it up. Like, so what, wait, so what do you want to do? So you're going to start it and... You know, you want to start a small group, you can start it, get it going, get some more started from there, and lead it up. Well, no, I, we, don't, we don't want to be, have our own small group, we just want to lead it. So basically, you want your title put on something and not do anything. Well, yeah, pretty much. Okay. And then, there were multiple ones like this, and then it came to a time that, I was the one persecuted for not putting them in the positions that they wanted to be in. It wasn't about what they wanted to be in. It's about what, who God wants in the position. I could care less. You might look like the perfect candidate for a certain position. But if God doesn't release me to allow you to be that, I can't do it. Then it has nothing to do with what we want. It's about what God wants. There's been times that I've wanted somebody to be in a certain position, but I didn't have the peace to do it, so I didn't. That it has nothing to do with the, the physical, it's with the flesh. And then there got to a point that, as a pastor, you know problems that people have and individuals, and they come and tell you stuff, and I'm not going to go blab it to everybody. But that's why there has to be a respect that if I say they don't need to be in a leadership position, just leave it alone. Because there's a good chance I know more about that person than you do. And sometimes I just want to strangle people and like, listen, if you knew what I knew, you'd understand what I'm saying right now. But too many times it's about us and not about God. That if God wants to leave us to a spot that we're hidden for the rest of our lives, but we're doing what he wants, that's what it should be about. That it shouldn't have anything to do with us. If God wants you to, to move a mountain for someone, and he says not to say it, you don't say it. You may see the greatest miracle ever happen, and it may have been by your faith, but God says don't tell anybody better keep your mouth shut because it's not about you believe me because that's where pride comes in when you begin to say look what I did so even when God does things through me and speaks through me believe me I'm shocked now what I was telling you earlier I'm shocked a lot of times I'm going really are you really telling me that but it's not about us. It has to be about God and everything we do. Beginning to walk like Christ. Christ didn't walk around saying, do you see what I did today? No, he said, for it's not by my strength, but by my Father's. For it's not about me, but it's about my Father's will. His will be done, not mine. That even Jesus Christ knew it wasn't about him. 
And if he was that humble, how much humbler should we be? Is humbler a word? If not, okay, good. If not, it is tonight. Um, I make up a lot of words, just so you guys know. You guys probably already figured that one out. But once you begin to fulfill his plan for your life, once all of this is in sync, you are able to come to God with anything, knowing that your prayers are for his will and not yours. That you can actually come before him and know that what you're praying for is in his will. And when you know that your prayers are of his will, you know and have faith that he'll come through. You know that without a shadow of doubt, God, that this is what you want. I hear too many times, well, I'm believing for my prayer if that's what God wants. I'm believing for my healing if that's what God wants. So what you're saying is that you already have an excuse if you're not healed. If this is God's will, if this is God, we use that if this is God's will as a backup plan. And sometimes it may not always be God's will right now, but too many times we use it as a backup plan. If we don't get healed, we'll just say it wasn't God's will. If I don't get this new house, we'll just say it wasn't God's will. That too many times we use it as an excuse. And when you know all of this about being in his will, being in sync with him, knowing that your prayers are for his will, not yours, when you know this, you are now able to come to God with faith, knowing that your prayers will be answered. So many individuals don't see answered prayers because they don't follow the steps of receiving. First, fellowship with him, then living out his word. First, fellowship with him, and then living out his word. He said, if you abide in me, and then my words abide in you, you ask what you des- desire, and it will be done to you. Too many times we just ask what we desire. Too many times we're, we're asking, but we're not building anything with God. We're not getting to know him. We're not allowing him to live in us so that our heart changes to be like his heart. That our cry should be, God, make my heart like your heart. He's saying, ask what you desire. Because he knows by this time when you've done this, your heart's desires will be his desires. That he knows, if you allow me to live in you, you abide in my words, you allow my words to begin to pollute your mind, begin to change your mind, begin to change your thought process. How many of y'all know that when you give your life to the Lord, when you begin to focus on Him, your thought process becomes different than it once was? You begin to, to think of things completely different. You begin to go into situations and go, wow, I need to speak up. I need to shut up. That your entire process on everything is different. And when you begin to have faith in God, when you begin to know his will, you begin to walk in his will, there are times, so many times, that I'll be out places and God's like, you need to pray for them. Or you'll be out somewhere and you want to pray for someone that's sick because you want to see them healed. You want to see them raise up. You want to see God's power be shown. Not about you, but about God. That you get to a place, it goes from being scared, like, oh, no, somebody wants me to pray, to saying, when can I begin to pray for someone? When can I, when God, God, when, use me, whatever you want, Father. But it starts in the closet. It starts in prayer time on your own that nobody else sees. It starts about building a relationship with him, something greater that nobody else even knows about. It talks about fasting, to go and fast. To go and give up food and just spend time with him. This time that you would have done something else to put it aside and spend time with him. And he says, don't go around telling your neighbor about it. This is just time that I want between us. This is more that I want of a relationship to build with you. This isn't bragging rights. This is something you're supposed to do. Even when Jesus casted out demons, the disciples said, well, how come we couldn't cast them out? He goes, because this came by prayer and fasting. Too many times we pray, but we don't fast. 
I believe fasting a lot of time is the breaking point to get to the other side. We pray for something, we pray for something, we pray for something, and a lot of times it takes us fasting to get to the other side, to break something off. Why? Because it says here that when you abide in him, and my words abide in you, that you begin to know that fasting is a key. You begin to know that getting closer to him is a key to receive the prayer. And as you fast, you're getting closer to him. Y'all still out there tonight? Well, three of you are. Anybody else? Oh, wait, there's only three of you here. Um, <laughs> then it gets to a point with your faith that, listen to this, it gets to a point with your faith that prayers no longer become prayers, they become prophecy. That prayers no longer become prayers, they become prophecy. It's when you know God's will and you speak what is to come and you believe it because you know it's done. Because you know God's will and you know his plan for your life and you know what you're supposed to be doing. He's called you to it and you know, you know that he'll call you through it. And when you begin to pray for something and you know what his will is, you begin to say, God, this is your will. I know it. I pray for it. I receive it. And it becomes a prophecy. You begin to prophesy the things to come. He says to speak it. Your tongue is powerful. He says your tongue is powerful. I'm not going to preach on the tongue tonight. I did a whole long series on the tongue. If you want to know about that one, I'll get you a copy of the CD. It may take me, those of you watching out there, I know it may take me six months, but I'll get it to you. Um, you just have to keep asking me every week. Uh, Psalms 37, 3 through 5, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord, trust also in him, and then he will bring it to pass. Trust in the Lord and do good. So you need to trust in him, do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. You need to feed on him and delight yourself in him. It says, and he should give you the desires of your heart. But you must commit your ways to the Lord. Your ways must be committed to him. And trust in him. And he will bring it to pass. But your ways must be in the Lord. Want to know why so many miracles happen in Jesus' ministry? Because he knew the will of God and he lived it out. He knew the will of God and he lived it out. And there's a difference between just knowing the will of God. You can know the will of God, but if you don't live it out, you'll never see it come to pass. I knew what God's will for me was since I was a little child. But I walked away from it, wasn't living it out. When you know God's will, you stand on it, you believe it 100%, and then you also act and live it out. You act and live it out, and that's what Jesus did. He lived it out. Too many people don't know if it's God's will, so they don't have the faith for it. And the reason they don't know if it's God's will, because they're not abiding in him and his word abiding in them. Because when you begin to draw closer to him, you begin to know his will for your life. You begin to know his will for your life. There were so many times I just remember, God, what's your will for my life? God, what do you want for my life? God, this, God, that. I spent more time praying, asking God what his will was, instead of actually digging in and getting closer to him and allowing him to show me his will. Too many times we, even in prayer, we wonder why God doesn't speak to us because too many times in prayer, our tongue never shuts up. Too many times in prayer, listen to this, be still before the Lord, be quiet before the Lord. Too many times in prayer, we go before the Lord and we just keep jabbing and jabbing and jabbing. And then after we go, I don't know why God didn't speak to me. Did you ever allow him to speak? It's okay to show up before him and just be still. He says, be still before. To just show up. Sometimes I just show up and I'll just lay there in my office floor. 
Let's say thank you, Jesus. And I'll just lay there and just let them speak to me. And just listen. And believe me, if you haven't done this the first couple times, the first 20 times you do this, sometimes you feel really weird. Showing up to your secret place feels awkward because it's not something your flesh was designed to do. It's something your spirit is. It's not something your flesh wants to do. It's something your spirit needs to do. It's something your spirit wants to do. That's why I, I have problems with this. I get home. I am tired. I just want to sit on the couch and relax. And I can hear something in me say, you need to pray. You should read the word. I'm tired. I just want to turn the TV on, not think about anything, and just relax. But you have to crucify your flesh, turn the TV off, and go do what your spirit's telling you to do. Because you have to train your flesh to be crucified. You have to train your flesh to shut up. And when you begin to train your flesh and begin to listen to the spirit, the more you'll begin to obey the things of the spirit. The more you'll begin to listen to God, the more you, it'll be... It doesn't always become easier because things just get tougher. But you begin to see the results of the crucifixion that you've put your flesh through, that you begin to want to do the things of God. You begin to want to turn off that TV. I hear people say they don't have any time to read or pray. How much TV do you watch a week? How much entertainment is in your life? And I'm not telling you to eliminate TV. I'm not telling you to eliminate entertainment. I'm not telling you to eliminate the things that you love to do. But he does say, seek first the kingdom of God. He does say, Put me first. He says, he's a jealous God. And believe me, if he's a jealous God, could you imagine if he's like, hey, you haven't said a word to me all day. You say you don't have time for me? What are you doing right now? What are you doing right now? And it's great, and I do it. I pray in my car, go back and forth, worship, pray. You should do that. But that shouldn't be your only time with God because you're not setting any time aside for him. You, you need to, to have a time where you're going to God and you're saying, God, I'm setting time aside for you. My wife gets upset if I'm talking to her, but I'm on my phone too. If I'm talking to her and I'm watching TV at the same time, she would rather, if she's in the room, and if you're watching out there, honey, I love you. This is a good thing, okay? Okay. Um, but if she's in the room, she would rather me, we may not even be talking, but she would rather me turn off the TV and just be in her presence and nothing being said. But we can sit down and nothing said. It's quiet. And I'm like, so you're not even spending time with me. Here we are. We're sitting here together. I'm just browsing Craigslist, seeing what's out there on eBay. She wants my divine attention. She wants all of my attention. And that's what God wants. He wants you to put, he says, put everything else aside. Go into your secret place. Turn off all distractions and focus on me. And focus on me. I had a buddy of mine. He called it uh, his wife HG2, Holy Ghost number two, because you can learn so much from them. And because a lot of times they have to speak through them to speak to you. And just things like that, an example of how our wives can be like the Lord, that they want your attention. And you can learn so much. My wife, when I get home, if she's watching, she's be like, oh, yeah, well, now you better start giving me your attention. You just preached it. So, oh, I shouldn't have talked about that tonight. <laughs> but here's the deal. It's if a savor abides in you. If the Savior abides in you. Then he knows what you need. He knows your desires. And when he abides in you and you in his word, 
And the word is inside of you and living in you and through you and out of you. And you're abiding on it. You're living in it. It's your daily bread. And you'll begin to receive the things that benefit you and benefit him. Too many times we ask for things that are outside of his will. There are certain things that you may have believed that you should have or believe that you should have right now, but God knows that if he'd give it to you, it may be full destruction for you. It may be full destruction for you. You have no idea what God has for you. There may be a job that you've been praying for, and God's saying, that's not it, because that's not my will for your life. That's not my plan for your life. There's been times that I've... I've not accepted promotions because I knew that it wasn't what God had for me. Even though in the flesh I looked like an idiot and felt like an idiot and called myself an idiot, but I knew it wasn't what God had for me, that it's about being in his will and what he has for you, not about your flesh's will, because your flesh's will will send you to hell. It will send you to hell. 1 John 2, 6 And I'm getting ready to wrap up. He who says he abides in him, it says, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk as he walked. Too many times people say they love Christ, say they know the word, they say they pray, but he's saying that's not enough. You must also live it out. There's atheists that know the Word of God. It means nothing. The devil knows the Word of God. Do you know how good the devil knows the Word of God? So much that he came before Jesus and quoted it to him. And he's like some preachers. He takes it out of context. It's true. He'll take things out of context. He'll begin to say, but didn't the Word say this? I love the people that like to to really drink a lot, and they like to use the scripture, but Jesus turned water into wine. But Jesus didn't get drunk. It was beet grapes. The alcohol content in it back then was probably really low. We won't even get into that. You can love Christ. You can love like Christ loves. All right, sorry. You can love, I got this written down here. You can love what Christ loves, but doesn't mean you hate what he hates. You can hate what he hates, but doesn't mean you love what he loves. You can love what Christ loves. A lot of times we think somebody's a Christian because they love what Christ loves. But... Do you hate what Christ hates? And there's other people that hate what Christ hates, but they don't love what Christ loves. The church has gotten this way. We, we love everyone, but we've forgotten to hate the sin enough to rebuke it. Jesus loved. He loved everyone, but he hated the sin and he rebuked it. And that's what we're supposed to do is love the people so much with such a godly love that we look above and beyond the sin that they're committing and we love their souls so much that all we want is for them to repent and turn away from it. That you could be a a murderer, a rapist, some of the worst of the worst, and Jesus would love you so much that he wants you to turn from your sins and follow him. Because he knows who you are, not what your sin is. He wants you to depart from the sin and follow him. He wants you to eliminate it out of your life, cut it off, and come after him. Because he knows that sin isn't who you are. The devil tries to tell you that's who you are, but he says, I can make you a child of God. That I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care where you've came from. The world may look at you and not forgive you. He says, but I do. Because I love you. That that's a love that we need to begin to learn.
but we look at the sin through our eyes instead of loving through God's eyes. Does that make sense? Jesus loved people and he hated sin. He loved people so much and hated sin so much that he did everything he could to try and get people to repent and turn from sin and follow it no longer. But now it's gotten to a point we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to uh, offend anyone. You know, I was at Bredco the other day. I texted the wife while I was sitting there. A lady walks up. I'm looking down, reading the Bible. I can see her in my peripheral vision. And all of a sudden, I just heard and just felt she's a Christian. Didn't even look at her, didn't see her. All I could see is just the side of her clothing, nothing at all. And I could, fe- fe- I could sense the presence of God. And I look up, and she sits down and has a Bible and opens her Bible up. I told the wife, I'm like, I've got to figure out a way to let people know. I mean, because I'd want to know. You know, somebody is there and they can sense the presence of God on you. I mean, that's a compliment. I want to know it. I'm like, but it's just hard for me to say things to females sometimes because, you know, it would just be like a really lame pickup line. <laughs> hey, uh, so I didn't say anything. But I started, Bethany's like, well, just, just tell her, you know. I'm like, yeah, I just, yeah, I just sometimes... But that's the way it should be, that people should be able to feel the presence of God on you. They should be able to sense it on you. You should be able to walk into a room, they not even see you, and they feel God come in. That's the way it needs to be. That's the way we should live our lives, that He is abiding in us. We're abiding in Him. And I want to leave you with this illustration. I'm just going to use Craig's jacket for this. <laughs> What's that? Did you get any towels? These are okay to get wet, right? They'll dry. Sure, it'll work. Yeah, I was just going to do the floor. I didn't really care because the floor could use another good cleaning, right? In order for us to receive what God has for us, we must position ourselves right where he wants us. A lot of times we begin to do this, and as God begins to pour out himself upon us, he's pouring himself out, but we have to position ourselves in line with him to receive from him. But what happens is we receive just enough, and I watch this in church so many times, is that people begin to receive a little bit of God, and as God's still pouring out, They begin to wander off. They begin to use the little bit that God's given to them until they run dry, and then they're dry, and then they're they're, they're struggling, they're suffering, they're wondering what happened, and all of a sudden, they begin to come where they know God wants them, and he's still been pouring out the whole time. But it wasn't about him not pouring out his love. It wasn't about him not pouring out his grace or his mercy or pouring out his blessings or anything else. It was about us not positioning ourselves to where we need to be with Christ. Positioning ourselves before Him where He wants us. Too many times we begin to get there and think we've had it and we begin to run our own direction. As He's pouring it out, we come to church and we receive from God and we're like, yes, this is great and He's still pouring out and before you know it, we've, we've gone out, we've received, received enough joy to last us a week. We re- received enough from God to think we're good now. We went to church and we felt better. And then we begin to stop doing what we first did to position ourselves with Christ to receive. We begin to run away from it because we begin to have a little bit that we think we can run off of. But he said, he says that we are actually supposed to continue to receive from him that we're overflowing. That we're overflowing. And then what happens is, is when you're overflowing with him, You can be overflowing and somebody else should be out there receiving that overflowing that you have. Should be begin. I know I'm making a mess, but I really don't care. (laughs) But you it should be overflowing so much that you're you've got so much of God on you that when you walk into a place, people can begin.
begin to receive from you. People can begin to say, wow, what is going on with that person? Wow, well, every time he comes in the room, I don't know what it is, but I just get excited. I don't know what it is, but all peace comes upon me. I don't know what it is, but when I see God there, when I see him there, I just feel the presence of God. That it should be something so strong on us that, that we stop unpositioning ourselves that the big thing is positioning yourself to receive from God. Position yourself. That we do it as we position ourselves and what happens is work gets busy and we start following after this. What happens is then we position ourselves back and then we begin to run dry because kids had ball games. We got wrapped up in something else. It's not always because of sin but it's because of distractions. And the devil uses the distractions to keep us out of the position that God wants us. That God wants you to be in a position to receive from him. He wants you to be in a position that you'll receive an overflowing, an abundance of. That you'll continue to receive. It's not about coming before God on Sundays and receiving from Him or on Wednesday nights. It's about a continuation of receiving from God. If the only time I felt love from God on Sundays, I'd probably give up. Because I want to be in a position that I'm feeling the love of God all day long. Because when you don't, it's miserable. Especially when you've gone into a house and you felt the love of God. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if you only felt love from your wife one day a week? Let's put it the other way. Could you imagine if he only showed you love for a few hours a week? You'd be like, yo, I'm giving up on this. This is horrible. It's not the way God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to get in a position just to receive from him once in a while. He wants us to line ourselves up in a position to receive from him abundantly, to receive from him nonstop, that our life continues to receive from him over and over again. Amen? We receive just enough sometimes to get us by, but not enough to live on. Then we go back for some, and we get just enough until we run dry and feel like God has forsaken us, when actually he's been right there the whole time. It's just we haven't been in the position he wants us to be. We go back for some, just enough that we run dry and feel like God has forsaken us when actually he's right where he wants us. And I didn't say we are right where he wants us. I said he, that he's there right where he wants us to be. But too many times we're right here and we want God to be here. But God's waiting for us to come to him and receive. That he's been there pouring it out for us and pouring it out and pouring it out but it's about us coming to receive. It's about us positioning ourselves to receive from him. And we're out of his will. Not only can it be that we don't receive what he has for us, but we mess up what we already have. When we are out of his will, not only can it be that we don't receive what he has for us, but we mess up what we already have. Our marriage, our job, our finances, our health, our family, our life. We do things we would have never done if we were following him like we should. That too many times I've watched individuals. They come and receive from God. And they walk away. And they lose even more than where they started. Because now they've gotten to a place and to a position in their lives that not only are they not receiving what God has for them, but they're beginning to mess things up because they know where they're supposed to be. They know where they're supposed to be, and they begin to do things after the flesh instead of after the Spirit. And I encourage you today to begin to align yourself up to receive from Christ. That he wants to pour himself out into you. He wants to show himself so real. Even his power, he wants to pour out upon you to receive it. To receive it. But you have to begin to align yourself up with his will. He doesn't want to pour his power upon somebody 
that's not going to use it wisely. Think about that. A lot of times we're, we're like, God, I, I want to see miracles. I want to see this. I want to see that. But God's waiting for you to line yourself up and get aligned with what he has for you so he can begin to pour into you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father.